Hello and welcome to our daily video, Indigenous Woman of Brant, presented by Brant Museum and Archives in honor of Museum Month 2021. Today's video celebrates some extraordinary Indigenous women of our area and recognizes their many accomplishments. Edith Anderson Montour was one of the first Canadian Indigenous women to become a nurse and the last surviving World War I Army nurse, dying a week before her 106th birthday. She was born and raised on the Six Nations Reserved. Despite only having an elementary education available to her, she was determined to continue her education, enrolling in Brantford Collegiate at age 20 with the hopes of becoming a nurse. All Ontario nursing schools would unfortunately reject her application due to her being Indigenous. This led to her applying to and being accepted to a nursing school in New Rochelle outside of New York City, where she would work until the United States entered the war in 1917. She would join the Westchester County Unit B United States Expeditionary Force. After returning from France in 1920, she returned After to returning Osh from weekend, France in where 1920, she would marry and start Edith a family. She continued Osh working as a nurse until she was 70 years old. At she continued Williamson working Hospital. as a nurse until she was 70 years Ethel old. Brant working Montero at Lady was a lecturer, Williamson Hospital. author, and expert on Indigenous history and culture. She was also the great great granddaughter of Joseph Brandt. During her life, Ethel fought for the rights of Indigenous people, including full citizen rights and the right to vote. She also fought for the revisions of depictions of Indigenous people and groups in history textbooks dem demanding the removal of the racial biases. Ethel grew up on the New Credit River Reserve. With, with little formal education available, Ethel educated herself through reading. After she married Wilbur Monter, she moved to the Six Nations Reserve and devoted herself to her community. She worked at the local Women's Institute and founded the Women's Section of the Ontario Association of Agricultural Societies. In the 1930s, Ethel left her family and home to pursue her dreams. She moved to Rochester, New York, and began research on her great-great-grandfather. She would lecture in both Canada and the United States and collaborated with the historical writer Harvey Calmers about Joseph Brandt, publishing books in 1943 and 1955. When she moved back to, to Canada, residing in Toronto, Ethel would publish her own book. For her distinguished work, Ethel received the Canadian Centennial Medal in 1967. Alma Green was also known by her Mohawk name, Ga Wan Nosdo, or Forbidden Voice in English. She was born on the Six Nations Reserve to John Charles of the Mohawk Wolf, Wolf Clan and her mother, Sarah Martin of the Mohawk Turtle Clan, who was also a clan mother. During her youth, her father was a Mohawk chief and took her with him to visit other reservations across Ontario and New York State. She was trained by her mother for her future role as clan mother and also in the art of herbal remedies to, to become a medicine woman. At age 16, she took the wampum beads and became clan mother, acting as a spiritual and political leader of the, for the turtle clan. During her 66 years as clan mother, Alma continually fought for the political rights and recognition of her people and the revival of the Mohawk faith, in, including the longhouse. She used documentation and publicity to amplify her voice, speaking against the reduction of Indigenous lands and denying the legality of the sale of large parts of land to non-Indigenous. She obtained a buckskin coffee, copy of the 1784 Halliman Treaty and repeatedly traveled to Ottawa to fight her case. Alma was also a literary success, publishing three books, the first published in 1971 and the second published in 1975. A third was published for the elementary education on the reserved. It was a collection of hymns translated into the Mohawk tongue. Emily General grew up on a Six Nations farm. She was born to a Cayuga father and a Mohawk mother. Education was very important to her, and to finish high school, Emily would live with another Indigenous family during the week to attend school in Caledonia and return to the farm on weekends. In 1926, Emily obtained her teaching cer certificate from Hamilton Normal School and began teaching at Old School Number 9. During her career as a teacher, as she was fluent in both Cayuga and Mohawk languages, Emily would use traditional stories and customs to teach her students and connect them with their heritage. In 1930, Emily was appointed to be the spokesperson for the Confederacy Council of the Six. She led the group to England to search for archival evidence that Six Nations were allies and not subjects of the British throne. After a year, she found proof and returned home. However, when she returned home, the government was upset because she had hired her own substitute for her leave, and they suspended her for three years. After her sus suspension, she returned to teach for another 15 years, but in 1948, her license was revoked because Emily refused to declare her allegiance to, to the crown, as all teachers were required to do so, because Emily asserted her loyalty as an ally, but never as a subject of the crown. 
After her license was revoked, Emily returned to farming full-time and became more politically active. She would spend her summers debating indigenous rights in the United States, and she would fight to, to preserve border rights between Canada and the United States and the exemption of the Ontario sales tax for indigenous people on reserves. Emily also established the Six Nations pageant to help maintain woodland traditions. Emily was also instrumental in the reburial of the mass grave found on Tarboros Hill in Scarborough. She ensured the reburial followed the sacred ritual of her people. In celebration of all her hard work and advocacy, in 1991, the Emily C. General Elementary School was opened. Elda Smith is known as the woman that revived traditional Iroquois pottery. She was instrumental in bringing change to the culture and economy of the, of the reserve through authentic indigenous crafts, leading her to produce her own. She first started with beadwork, making beaded bags, jackets, and jockey silks. She also brought in, in instructors to teach classes in silver making, silver screening, and pottery. Pottery soon became her favorite, and but since pottery hadn't been made on the reserve for nearly 200 years, Elda consulted books, libraries, museums, and elders as resources. Through trial and error, Elder, Elda and her husband discovered and recreated the techniques and materials used to re recreate indigenous pottery. She created geometric designs using cord wound twigs, notches, and thumbprints. Elda's work drew from ancient Iroquois designs and form using symbols and motifs, even drawing from old wampum belts. For the Canadian Centennial in 1967, Elda was commissioned to make presentational pieces for the guest of the Canadian government, including Queen Elizabeth. She also had a tea set displayed in the Canadian Pavilion at Expo 70 in Japan. Elda's pieces can be found in museums across North America in the Royal Ontario Museum and the Smithsonian. Elda was committed, committed to the continuation of the traditions, teaching classes and passing the knowledge down to future generations. We hope you enjoyed learning about these five extraordinary women and hope it has inspired you to go out and learn more about past and current Indigenous women and leaders. Thank you for tuning in. Look out for tomorrow's video on the Onondaga Women's Institute.